So the 90s didn't stop being a time of crisis in Venezuela. In 94 there was also a major banking crisis and Chavez was released from prison under the new presidency of President Caldera. Even though Chavez rejected being classified in a left-right dichotomy, he did fill the ideological vacuum that we talked about in the previous video. An astonishing fact is that Chavez had never been charged with treason for his coup attempt in 92, a further sign of how established rules were no longer seen as legitimate. In 1998, Chavez's party became second strongest in Congress behind Acción Democrática and he was elected president. Chavez's Bolivarian revolution was at the beginning, more than anything, a call to national unity. He thought that Venezuela's problems had their root in that people had been disunited and fighting against each other rather than recognizing that their problems stem from a corrupt elite controlling the two old parties and particularly the state. So his idea was to unite the people against this elite and removing the elite's influence from the state, particularly by writing a new constitution. Juro delante de Dios, juro delante de la patria, juro delante de mi pueblo, que sobre esta moribunda constitución haré cumplir, impulsaré las transformaciones democráticas necesarias para que la República Nueva tenga una carta magna adecuada a los nuevos tiempos. Lo juro. As the name suggests, Chávez based his Bolivarian revolution on his interpretation of the history of Simón Bolívar, who liberated large parts of Latin America from Spanish colonial rule in the early 19th century and is the central figure in Venezuelan identity. Chávez saw a direct continuation from Bolívar's times in that the people were still oppressed, maybe not by a colonial occupation, but by a neo-colonial elite whose loyalty lay not with the Venezuelan people, but with foreign investors. So the Bolivarian Revolution is ideologically speaking very similar to a nationalist independence movement, calling for internal unity against an external threat. But this required, to some degree, that internal dissent was delegitimized because it's a bit like treason and cooperation with the enemy. The other difference is that Bolivar fought against imperialists who agreed that they belonged in this category. They openly defended the Spanish crown. In contrast, nobody says, hey, I'm part of what you call a neo-colonial elite. In other words, it's a projected category, not a self-defined one. And because of that, it's never really sure who that elite exactly is. Additionally, particularly the new political left was populist in both style and form. And Chávez was the impersonation of this trend if there was one. In style that meant he appealed to national sentiment and emotion directly, not to people's rationality and reason. In form that meant he accepted no dissent as legitimate in his fight against the enemy. A man of the military, he saw this as a battle and he was the comandante. Over the years he described elections as battles, his supporters as battle units, support of school children as communication guerrillas, denigrated the opposition as fascists which he threatened to pulverize and reduce to cosmic dust. Yo tengo derecho a responderle. Claro, lo que es igual pero, a a Exacto, lo que es igual de acuerdo, pero a responder dentro de las líneas de un presidente. Claro, no, yo no puedo maniatarme por, por ser presidente, yo soy un combatiente. Si a mí me ataca alguien a través de una cadena Tiene de derecho medios, a defenderse. De manera, a defenderme y atacar también. Y no atacar solo, también, la, la, lógico, la, pero, la mejor defensa es el ataque. Sí, pero recuerde una cosa, la mejor defensa es el ataque militarmente hablando, pero usted no está montado en un tanque, está en la silla de no, mira, la claro. política, qué le puede ocurrir? Que la política es igualito que la guerra. No, dice que es la extensión la, la de la guerra. La ciencia de la política Pero le puede ocurrir que se puede de privar de gente valiosa, porque yo el miedo que le tengo esos ataques es que le van quitando gente con la cual usted necesita gobernar con esa gente. Hasta ahora no ha sido así. A problematic logic here is that this combination of a projected category with populism makes all of the state part of politics. So judges, police personnel and other public servants 
formerly independent of the president, were now forced to decide whether they were loyal with the president and his Bolivarian revolution and the people, or against it and with the supposed elite. So a bit like with a gun, Chavez could fire the undesired category of the elite at anybody who disagreed with him, be they political leaders, but also, for example, judges, state personnel in general, or the police. And the accumulated effect of this over the years was that fewer and fewer of these state institutions remained independent of the presidency as they should. It is often said that the poor and working classes supported Chavez more than the middle class. Now elections are anonymous, so that's difficult to test. One way of doing it is simply asking people who they voted for and how much money they have. So relying on polls. Now the problem with polls is that you can't possibly ask the entire population how much they earn and who they vote for. So you always have to rely on a small sample of the population and hope that it's representative for the entire society. After some thinking, we thought we'd do it in another way. We look at data from neighborhoods, because if it were true that poor and rich people systematically vote differently, it would also be true that poor and rich neighborhoods vote differently. And this data does exist. After looking around, we found that the 2001 census contains poverty levels at the level of the municipality and sometimes even parish. And on the website esdata.info, we also found detailed election data from 98. So now we'll combine the two sets of data into a diagram here on the table. On this axis will represent poverty. So there are neighborhoods with fairly little poverty to neighborhoods where there is quite a lot of poverty. And on the other axis will represent support for Chavez in the 98 election. Now if it were true that neighborhoods with little poverty also support Chavez uh, very little, there would be a lot of neighborhood points here in this corner up to with some kind of shape to up here with neighborhoods with a lot of poverty supporting Chavez a lot more. And Let's look at the data now. So now filling in all the neighborhoods, you see it's more like a cloud. The relationship isn't really clear or simply put, there is no relationship. And remember that in the 98 elections, the society was just fed up with the old parties. And in political science, we would call that a protest vote and Chavez was the protest candidate. So it's not very surprising that there is little relationship between poverty and support for Chavez in this election.